Waiting Castle is probably a fortification you've never heard of. When the word castle is used, you most probably think of huge buildings such as Dover Castle, an imposing and colossal structure that stands overlooking the English Channel, guarding England from attack. Or maybe you think of the Tower of London, a place synonymous with medieval history, torture and the execution of members of the aristocracy and even monarchy. Or possibly you might think of Warwick Castle, a scene of great opulence and a castle of huge dominance and grandeur. However, Wheaton Castle is the complete opposite. In this video, we look at this beautiful ruin in Norfolk in England, show you around and also tell its fascinating story. So join us as we visit Wheaton Castle. Remember to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Norfolk is the county in which Wheaton Castle sits in and this itself has a rich history, being the foundations of where Boudicca and the Iceni tribe originated from and also with it being the birthplace of one of English history's most polarising figures, Oliver Cromwell. In the southwest of the county sits the village of Wheating, a rather quiet and picturesque village with some amazing scenery. The castle is found 750 metres to the north of the village and previously there was an Anglo-Saxon settlement on the site in the 10th century. The castle itself was built around 1180 by Hugh de Plas. You'll notice that it's made from flint and interestingly the huge flint mines of Grimes Graves are nearby, so flint was a key building material easily gathered in a local area. Hugh de Plas was a tenant of William de Warren, the Earl of Surrey. The first Earl of Surrey, who shares the name William de Warren, came to Britain during the Norman Conquest, fighting at the Battle of Hastings for William the Conqueror. Following this, he was given a huge amount of land and this was subsequently passed down throughout generations. The Warren stronghold in Norfolk was at the nearby Castle Acre and stay tuned for a video on this amazing place. Hugh de Plas acquired the estate and the land that Wheating Castle stands on following his marriage and then he decided to construct a very large stone manor house. This new building was intended to resemble the hall at the centre of the Castle Acre fortification which was being redeveloped by Hamlin de Warren, the Earl of Surrey at the time. Despite being called a castle, Wheating was never fortified in a way in which castles were. This was never a castle, intended to be a defensive stronghold or an imposing mark on the locals nearby. In fact, Wheating Castle is more of a medieval manor house and in fact is one of the best remains of a 12th century manor house in the British Isles. Hughes Manor was around 30 by 14 metres across and comprised of three sections, a chamber block, a main hall and a service block. A moat would be added to the castle in the mid 13th century and everything inside this structure was designed to scream out the wealth of the owners. A visit to Wheating Castle at the time would have been a grand experience. In the 14th century, the male line of the Plas family died out and Wheating Castle then passed to the Howard family of Norfolk. These were extremely wealthy and powerful people. In fact, the John Howard who inherited Wheating, his grandson would go on to become the Duke of Norfolk and was slain at Bosworth Battlefield fighting for his dear friend, Richard III. This John Howard would actually be the great-grandfather of two of Henry VIII's wives, Catherine Howard and Anne Boleyn, who both met their end at the sharp blade of an axe, having been beheaded on the King's orders. Between the 15th century and the 18th centuries, Wheating Castle had been left to fall into ruin and was severely neglected. In 1770, it became an ornamental feature incorporated into the grounds of Wheating Hall, a nearby country house. In 1926, the Ministry of Labour, a government department that dealt with unemployment in Britain, bought the land of Wheating Hall and used it as a residential work camp. The trainees working under the government scheme were ordered to clear the castle of the undergrowth. Archaeological excavations took place in the 1960s at Wheating and the stonework was touched up and you can see this is a state which is left in today. So let's start our detailed look at the different parts of the castle. Imagine you're in the medieval times and you've been invited to see Wheating Castle by the powerful owners. Your entrance would have been similar to how it is today. You would have been greeted by a huge manor building, a structure that oozes power and wealth. Chances are that the roof would have been thatched the strong flint walls would have been imposing and the moat would have been filled with water. There was no guardhouse or tower which you would have been checked at and you would have just walked up to the entrance. A huge rectangle manor would have stood in front of you which in places was three stories high. 
a service block was contained at one end of the castle's building. Inside here would have been a series of many different rooms, used to cater for the needs of the owner's family. You would have expected to have found a pantry and a buttery here, which were tasked with the storing of food for some of Hugh de Plassey's extravagant episodes of entertainment in his banquets. Excavations in this area have shown that the castle was serviced by a freestanding kitchen. This was used for preparing animals and other foods for the banquet. The castle was shielded by a boundary wall, which separated the courtyard which was probably rather disgusting, due to food waste being thrown in here. The last thing you'd want to see when you arrive at the castle near the entrance was waste being thrown from the kitchen, and this is why it was probably kept separate. The Great Hall was the most important part of any medieval house or even castle. This was the place where the castle's owners or even royalty would do their entertaining, hosting huge banquets and parties to showcase their wealth and status. Inside one of these parties, there would have been music, entertainment and much mixing and conversation, however at the top of the Great Hall would have been a table specifically for the royalty or the castle's owners to sit at. This would have been facing the guests in a similar fashion to a wedding to show off who's hosting the grand festivities. Wheating Castle's Great Hall was huge. Today you can see the outline of the walls and it's not hard to imagine the size of this particular room. As you look up the stonework too, you can imagine how tall it was and this room would have been open exposing the timber roof. This was an area where guests would arrive into the castle so they would need to be impressed from the outset. Looking at the remaining wall today, you can still see the outlines of columns and archways. Here would have been wooden arches painted brown which would have contrasted and looked extremely decorative against a white plaster wall. There would have also been an entrance into the service block for guests to easily be served by the household servants or staff, and food would have come from the kitchen into the great hall through the service block having been carried across the courtyard. Wine and beer would have been kept next door in the pantry, meaning guests could quickly get another drink and get even more merry. The Great Hall at Wheating was huge and it easily is the biggest and most impressive room in the castle. Leaning off the Great Hall was a chamber block. This block or tower was three stories tall and on the first floor was a solar, a rather impressive and opulent private living quarters for the castle's owners. The solar would be decorated with ornate tapestries and artwork, showing the wealth of the castle's owners and this was also a reception room as well. However, it's primarily the room where the family would live and carry out their everyday duties. Underneath this room would have been a vaulted ground floor, probably used for storage. Inside the chamber block were a number of rooms for living, including the remains of a mural fireplace that you can still see today in the wall. Looking at the ruins, you can see a number of doorways and window arches that are particularly derelict. You can also make out where the ceiling post would have been, which can help you plot out the three different stories of this area. There would have been an external staircase granting access to the first floor and an internal staircase in the northwest corner that linked the different floors. So specifically, the chamber block was the area in which the family of the castle would live in and spend most of their time. Just behind the service block is a rather intact garderobe. In fact, this area is the most complete in the whole of the castle. In history, a garderobe is a room which was used for a number of different purposes. In this area, Valuables could have been stored, or this could have just been a private room and an extension from a bedroom. Most commonly though, garderobes were one of two rooms. They are seen sometimes as a wardrobe, where clothes were locked away and where the family would get dressed in the morning. However, a more interesting purpose for the garderobe is the fact they were typically known to be medieval toilets. This latrine block would have contained three cubicles for people to do their business on. This would then be drained into a room which was found in the basement at ground floor level. Then the human waste would be dumped elsewhere and washed down by using water in the moat. Talking of the moat, it encircles the whole of the property of Wheating Castle. This moat was created later and was built around the mid 13th century. This created an island of around 85 by 60 meters and meant the castle had to be accessed by a bridge. The moat was never intended to be used as a defensive structure, as it's extremely small and not very deep at all. It was only built to add to the beauty of Wheating Castle, making it look more opulent with a clean moat of water running around it. There is also a small ice house found within the site of Wheating Castle, 
This was added centuries later, after the castle was built, and was used by Weeting Hall to store ice for drinks. Historians have said that Weeting Castle is one of the finest and rarest examples of an early medieval manor house in Britain. It's an extremely amazing place to visit, you can really picture what this site would have looked like almost 850 years ago when building first began. As you walk around the ruin, you're escorted into the medieval period and the wealth of a family and their dream to create a home that greatly elevated their social status. This was a house of huge wealth and opulence and was aimed to connote a sense of grandeur into the mind of anyone who visited. Once again, thank you for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Once again, thanks for watching.